Good afternoon. I'm Lee Cobb. I'm a Kiowa Conservancy trustee, and I'm also chair of the Preservation and Stewardship Committee. Um, this afternoon, I am absolutely delighted to introduce, or perhaps for many of you, to reintroduce Dr. David Plar, aka Dr. Dave, author, researcher, and teacher, and one of Kiowa's absolute favorite presenters on sea turtles. While Dr. Dave is a highly regarded doctor and professor of obstetrics and gynecology, it is his degree in marine sciences that underpins his passion for and his remarkable encounters with sea life and wildlife. A number of Kiowa folks have had the good fortune to travel with Dr. Dave, and one of them, Beth Tomei, is with us today and has a remarkable story to share after Dr. Dave's presentation. Enjoy. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining in and viewing this afternoon. Uh, and I wanna thank the Kiowa Conservancy, uh, the members of which have worked so hard to make this possible. All I've had to do is jump in a little salt water with a few uh, pussy cats um, called sharks and rays. Uh, I had some videos that I was gonna show if we uh, had a delayed start, but because of the technological efficiency of everybody, we're ready to get right into it. Uh, sharks and rays, not a mean bone in their bodies because they're made of all cartilage uh, with, with the possible exception of their teeth. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, I really wanted to name this talk, Pussy Cats of the Sea, you'll see which species they represent. But let's get right into it. You know, the largest fish in the entire ocean, in the world's oceans, is the whale shark, up to 40 feet long, weighing up to 46,000 pounds. It's the largest fish. You might say, whoa, 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 largest animal in the ocean is not the whale shark. I agree, largest animal in the ocean is, of course, the blue whale. And the largest bony fish in the ocean happens to be the sunfish or mola mola. But again, the largest fish, which includes the cartilaginous species, as this whale shark is a fine, handsome representative thereof, uh, is in fact the largest fish species in the ocean. And I'm often asked, you know, is a whale shark, come on, is it a whale or is it a shark? Well, clearly, as you can see, it has gills, so it's a fish, therefore it's a shark species versus obviously a whale species is a kind of marine mammal. So it's definitely a fish or a shark species is the whale shark. But if you don't mind, before we talk any more about sharks, with your kind indulgence, I'd like to introduce you to a few rays. And here they are. Yeah, Ray Romano, Ray Charles, Ray Bradbury. And do you notice something that's immediately apparent that these rays all share in common? They all have teeth, which distinguishes them from manta rays. And maybe you too have enjoyed an enigmatic night dive with these giant, gentle, graceful, and elegant manta rays. This footage that I'm sharing with you, I took right off of uh, Big Island, Hawaii, in about 30, 35 feet of water. The dive is best done at night because, you see, manta rays are attracted to light. So, during daylight hours, the sun, of course, casts its light across the entire sea. And so, therefore, may be elusively dispersed the mantas across the entire sun-dappled sea, not very conducive for those of us diving in just 30 feet of water. However, after sunset, with no natural ambient light left to attract the mantas, then scuba divers can take the opportunity to deploy artificial light sources on the seafloor, again, at a depth of about 30 feet. From there, those lights emit focused columns of light which attract phytoplankton that live by harnessing the energy from light, utilizing that energy to convert carbon dioxide plus seawater into nutrients, oxygen, and glucose. These nutrients in turn attract predators upon the phytoplankton, 
zooplankton, copepods, arthropods, and even miniature shrimp called krill that you see there in the lower right. They all are attracted to the light now to feed upon the energy-rich phytoplankton. And then paradoxically, it is these tiny organisms in the light column which comprise the primary foodstuff for the massive manta rays. For with their 18 to 24 foot wingspans, the mantas simply filter feed without any teeth upon these tiny little critters. And so that is why mantas are attracted to the light. It's where the food is. Here you see those tiny organisms silhouetted against the beautiful white underbelly of a feeding manta. You don't have to be a diver to enjoy the graceful manta rays. Snorkelers too can observe from the surface while holding onto surfboards that you see are also fitted with artificial light sources as the mantas then glide through the lit food column in what I think you'd agree could well be described as a manta ballet. Their feeding behavior consists of a series of perfectly executed backward rolls through the food column as into their gaping but toothless mouths, they gracefully devour countless tiny organisms in order to support their massive metabolisms. You will note the curved pair of cephalic lobes hanging from either corner of its mouth. When the manta is feeding, he utilizes these to sweep or funnel the plankton toward its mouth. Also, each manta ray has on its white underside a unique pattern or array of black blotches as unique to each manta as our fingerprints unique to each of us. To feed most efficiently, the manta's gills are equipped with several sets of gill plates, filtration plates, if you will, of graduated sizes with which the manta can filter out the smallest of copepods up to the largest krill, directing those down his esophagus while otherwise allowing seawater to escape and pass through its gill apparatus, which then efficiently extracts oxygen that's dissolved in the seawater. After having executed about three to six backward rolls, the mantas have pretty well devoured most of that food column. So then, just as gracefully as they arrive into the light column, they will simply depart and glide away into the darkness in search of their next food source. So why the mantas are misnamed devil rays I will never understand. For without teeth in their mouths, nor a barb on their tails, these creatures are completely docile, delicate, and defenseless. I think you'd agree that as they are as gentle as a lamb and as graceful as a ballerina, they are not devil rays at all, but could be better described as perfect angels. So really, why are mantas named or called devil rays in the popular media? Well, to recap, while a manta is feeding, its oblong cephalic lobes are extended, as you see in the slide, the image before you there is he's swimming right toward me. Open mouth, you see the gill slits below, but the cephalic lobes are deployed. But this manta, just now having completed his final pass through the food column, well, it's time for him to clear the table and put away his utensils, as it were. So he will neatly recoil those cephalic lobes. First, the left. And then the right.
So now in the non-feeding mode, I guess I can imagine the horned shape of his retracted cephalic lobes combined with his jet black skin. I suspect maybe that's what gave rise to the illusion of a devil and earned him that misnomer devil ray. And this mobula ray, a, a, a type of manta called the mobula ray that I photographed off the coast of Puerto Vallarta, deftly illustrates why they are called devil rays with their jet black skin and their horned-like recoiled cephalic lobes. And who knew that devil rays could fly or skip like rocks or breach just like dolphins and whales? Here, a mother is teaching her juvenile how to breach. You see the juvenile behind the mother sports much lighter shades of gray versus the jet black adult. Importantly, this very skill learned by this juvenile may one day make the difference between its life or death. For you see this eagle ray, which is actually not a type of manta, but a type of stingray, this spotted eagle ray had to fly or breach out of the water to escape the deadly jaws of a hammerhead. In this dramatic pelagic battle for survival between two formidable species, the ray had been underwater, darting, twisting, and turning, trying to evade, but unable to escape the very adept and agile hammerhead. So then, in a last resort, desperate maneuver of evasion and escape, the stingray mustered all of his energy and breached and it worked, as you see, because the hammerhead, in pursuit, unknowingly passed right underneath the stingray. So manta rays are closely related to sharks. Might not look at in this beautiful view of a manta ray against the sandy seafloor, but honestly, if you took a shark and steamrolled it, you'd, you'd pretty much end up with a manta ray. But the difference, very apparently, is the pectoral fins of the shark have been magnificently expanded into extended wings that permit them not only to glide through the water like ballerinas, but also to soar into the air like birds. Mobulas can reach heights of more than two meters, remaining airborne for several seconds. But as you will see in a moment, their landings are much less graceful. They create, create a loud slap onto the surface as they belly flop back onto the sea. The males doing this to attract attention of a potential mate. The bigger and the louder the splash, the more prowess and agility it represents, therefore making it more likely the female will pick him above all the rest to mate with later that night. This courtship ritual, therefore, serves to perpetuate the strength of the manta rays and mobula ray species by allowing only the most agile males to reproduce. Now, for the ladies watching, you're probably thinking this is, looks like male bar, bar room debauchery. But ladies, I hate to tell you, the girls don't behave much better. For to signal their approval of a male, look what the girls do. They flip for the boys. So, in this pelagic scene of seduction, self-indulgence at sea, it's a story where the girls flip and the boys, of course, they fly. And that's one of the few footages or images that's not my own. I, I want to give due credit and awe to Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who so kindly shared that remarkable footage so and gave me permission to share it with you. I'm most appreciative for that as I'm sure you are. Well, that was manta rays of which mobulas are a, a subspecies, but now meet a stingray. 
And as their name suggests, yes, their tails do have stingers. But contrary to popular notion, the stinger is not at the tip of the stingray's tail, but instead arises from the juncture of the proximal and middle thirds of the tail. And much akin to your own fingernail, it, the barb or the stinger is made of keratin and also very homologous to our own fingernails, the stinger is deeply embedded. You can't just pull out your nail when it gets a little hangnail. No, it's embedded firmly in your finger. Similarly, a stingray does not deploy its stinger. A bee does. When a bee stings, it loses its stinger and then goes on to die. But conversely, stingrays tenaciously hold on to this knife-like weapon, which as you can see from the actual image of one on the right, it is sharply barbed and serrated. Also, in contrast to the mantis and mobulas, stingrays not only have stingers, they also, as you see in this video, have teeth. Now, of course, as these are all species of fish, they don't breathe underwater like marine mammals do. Instead, they intake water. That water, seawater, goes over and through their gill apparatus, through which that magnificent apparatus extracts the dissolved oxygen from seawater to support the metabolism as in respiration of fish. So yeah, fish respire, but they don't breathe per se. So in the case of stingrays, they can intake water to get it over their gill slits, either through their, pardon me here, I'll get the pointer, through their mouths, through their gill slits themselves, or through these two paired holes right over the mouth, which if you're thinking of your own face, you'd say, well, those are nostrils. Yes, well, in fish species, since that they don't lead to lungs, they're not nostrils at all. They're called spiracles. And you see that they, all three of these apertures through which they can intake water are on their ventral or front undersurface. Many of you know though, that stingrays are nocturnal hunters, primarily for prey like um, squid and shrimp. But therefore by daylight, the vulnerable stingray best hide and or camouflage himself from his primary predator, tiger sharks, uh, great whites, and, and other shark species love to feed upon stingrays. So during daylight visible hours, the stingrays bury themselves in the sand. But that leads to the obvious question, then how do they breathe? Their spiracles, their gill slits, their mouth, they're all buried in the sand. How can they respire? How can they take in water? Well, it's through the apertures you see right behind their eyes. So pardon me, Here, here's the eyeball, the right eyeball. Here's this aperture, another set of two spiracles on top, on the dorsal surface. And let me show it to you here. This was footage I took in captivity on St. Thomas. So it's, it's much easier to see the eye and behind it, you see that aperture with a flapper. That flapper is an operculum that opens to let seawater in and closes so the seawater won't get back out. Because where does that seawater need to go? It needs to go not back out the same spiracle, but instead over the gill apparatus, which will then efficiently extract the oxygen. Oh. No, no, let me turn that down somewhat. This largely fictional movie released in June 1975 has single-handedly set into motion a global fear of and possibly even a hatred toward sharks. And I mean, you know, let, let's face it, they are apex predators in the ocean. Great white sharks have a bite strength of 670 PSI. Just to give you in Kiowa, um, a perspective that's five times stronger than a hawksbill turtle's bite, a hawksbill having the strongest bite of all species of sea turtles, which is about 118 PSI, but this is 670 PSI. And so, uh, you know, yeah, great whites have earned somewhat of a reputation, but they don't deserve a reputation as man-eaters. Uh, no species of shark has ever eaten a man. Several 
have bitten into humans only to quickly release realizing, oh, it's not a sea lion. I wonder why that guy was trying to look like a sea lion. He was wearing a black wetsuit. He was, you know, he was trying to fool me, I guess, but oh, yuck, I don't even like the taste. So that's how it goes for the great white. You know, and, and I'll be the first to admit that I too can succumb to the influence of widely held popular public opinion, like the commonly held notion that sharks are aggressive, vicious man-eaters. So when I saw on the legs of our young snorkel guide in the Caribbean several years ago, yeah, I, I got to admit, as I was listening to her safety briefing and seeing her knees, I, I thought, shark bite. So I'll candidly admit to you that I, after her briefing, I asked her, I said, so are those scars the result of a shark bite? And I'll never forget her reply verbatim. She said, you're only one letter off. Shark bite? I don't, I don't know. She goes, no, this is a result of a shark bike. And that's how she got those injuries on her legs. All right, but I'm here to share with you that sharks are indeed very sensitive. These large pores that you see concentrated primarily on the shark's rostrum and around its mouth harbor at the base of each of these pores very sensitive neurons called ampullae of Lorenzini that form an extensive cutaneous sensory network. The ampullae of Lorenzini are capable of detecting the most subtle of electrical fields and vibrations that all living beings put out. Uh, you know, in the human terrestrial context, some people say I can read auras. I don't know. I don't know if auras are electrical fields that some people are exquisitely sensitive to, or I, I, don't, I don't know how to opine on that, but nonetheless, underwater and with shark physiology, I know how to understand that these ampullae of Lorenzini can detect the subtlest of vibrations and electrical impulses, which of course, both of which are conducted very efficiently through water, making it even easier for the shark to, to perceive as it were. So, the message is, if when you're swimming underwater, you know, and there's, hey, if it's salt water, there could be sharks there. If you're swimming very confidently and calmly and smoothly, the shark can perceive your motion as conveying calm confidence. If on the other hand, you're going, I hope there's no sharks around here, you might as well be ringing the dinner bell for the shark at that point. So yeah, sharks are very sensitive in at least two ways. One is what we just discussed, their ampullae of Lorenzini, that by sensing animals that are weak, injured, or sickly, the sharks are very efficient. You know, the things portrayed in Jaws and Meg and all that, where sharks aggressively hunt, ambush, and attack, phew, that's a, an expenditure of a lot of energy that the sharks would rather not in nature uh, you, it's got to, energy has to be a, you know, a win-loss balance that favors win. You got to get more energy out of your prey than you spent chasing it. So that's why sharks, like any other predator, look for the weak, sickly, and injured, not the confident and calm. So by doing so, sharks serve a vital role in the ocean's ecosystem by preserving the strengths of all species by eliminating the weak members. And also because their main way of feeding isn't ambushing even wheat prey. The number one manner in which sharks prey is they just scavenge the ocean floor, the seafloor, because they're just looking for dead organic debris called detritus that it's also called marine snow because it's this drifting down toward the ocean floor, it looks like that, but it's someone else has already killed it. These are just shreds of organic matter that still have plenty of nutrient value. So another way in which sharks are sensitive is, if, if I was to throw to you a Nerf ball and ask you to tell me with your eyes closed to describe it, its texture, you would feel it in your hand, with your fingers in your hand. Yeah, well, sharks don't have fingers and hands. So how do sharks explore their environment? Not only through their ampullae of Lorenzini, which is primary, but secondarily through their teeth. Your teeth are very sensitive too. 
you, you bite down, uh, like if I was to bite onto my finger, my top teeth would convey that hard keratinized fingernail, the same material that stingray barbs is made of. Whereas my bottom teeth would conversely convey soft pulpiness in texture. Your teeth are very sensitive, so are sharks. Translate this basic science, if you will, to how to behave around sharks. And you know, you can enjoy doing shark dives off of uh, like Guadalupe Island in Mexican waters with great whites or uh, famously South Africa, Australia. You can dive with tiger sharks. Um, I'm blanking right now on the location. Oh, in the Bahamas, it's called uh, Tiger Reef or Tiger something uh, in the Bahamas. But I'm gonna show you how translating our understanding of shark physiology of the ampullae of Lorenzini allows one to confront, in this case, a great white. And you notice we're applying firm, gentle, confident pressure to where? The rostrum, where the highest concentration of ampullae of Lorenzini are. Not only does this confer to the shark our own confidence, moreover, that touch, that firm touch to the ampullae of Lorenzini stimulates a neural reflex, an outpouring from the brain of two neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin. And they flood the brain, causing the shark to fall into a rather tranquil, euphoric, hypnotic trance, an almost paralytic state that is termed in biology tonic immobility, tonic, the tone of its muscles, immobility. They lose all tone. And the shark at that point is as docile as a pussycat. Now, pushing and applying pressure to the ampullae, as I showed you here, uh, causes an outpouring of serotonin and dopamine. But our dive master in this next image that you've already seen now shows us how you can really get a massive outpouring of dopamine from the brain and that's to flip the shark upside down and you can see here does this shark not just remind you of a pussy you can all pussy cat you can almost imagine the purring or maybe it's a yellow lab just wanting its belly scratched if you want to see how the diver actually did it um, this is a great white but i'll show you again uh, in the Bahamas, another diver flipping this tiger shark. Tigers are much more aggressive than great whites because a great white will take one bite, release when it realizes it's not a sea lion. Tiger sharks will take repeated bites. I don't know why, but uh, not that they've never eaten a person. But anyway, watch this. Wow, firm pressure on the ampullae of Lorenzini, and then with the other hand, executing the flip of a completely docile, magnificent tiger shark. Wow. You know, where did we learn this behavior from? The answer is, we humans learned it from what may well be the single most intelligent species on the planet, without single exception, the orca, named or nicknamed the killer whale. I want you to watch this video on how the orca knows to invert the stingray. Also, the orca will itself invert so as to have a better advantage on the inverted stingray. Watch it, it happens kind of fast, so please enjoy. The stingray is inverted. Similarly, when that orca circles around to get it, the orca will, it won't attack like this. It will, right before it gets to the stingray, it will invert, grab the stingray, and then the orca will right itself, which by then the stingray has righted itself. So now what happens when the orca rights itself? Now the stingray is inverted again. It can't put up a fight. It can't sting the orca. Orcas teach their young to do this. Remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Here it is again. Well, 
you know, of course, great whites get all the fame, but really there's over 500 other species of sharks of which only 32 have ever bitten a human. Three aggressive species, the bull, tiger, and great white. The others have such small teeth they can barely nip through skin. But from the other 450 plus species of docile, harmless sharks, behold the elegant leopard shark that graces the shores of La Jolla, that's in San Diego's coastline, La Jolla Cove, every year during breeding season, May through August, where the females turn La Jolla Cove into their private labor and delivery suite. Absolutely beautiful animals, completely harmless. Yeah, they have teeth, but they, they don't bite, and there are so many amateur snorkelers out there. Another beautiful, harmless species is the nurse shark, shown here. Called a nurse shark with her very sand papery like skin, not because he or she is authorized to pass medications or to give intramuscular injections, but called a nurse shark because they can produce such suction within their mouths that sometimes underwater, you will hear them make this sound. <coughs> kind of like a baby nursing, but obviously much bigger. So um, strong is the negative pressure that a nurse shark can generate in her mouth that she can suck a live conch right out of its shell. Well, you know, with all my blessed encounters with such magnificent sea creatures, humpback whales, great whites, uh, um, so many beautiful, colorful reef fish and the like, I would imagine that by now you might be wondering if I've ever had a shark bite. And so I'll give you the honest answer to that. The answer is yes. I've actually had six, all very mild, but um, I'll show you my six shark bites. Here they are. I had them after a dive, the one with the mantas. Big Island, Hawaii. It's a Canadian beer, but I found my first six pack of it in Big Island and I had so much salt in my mouth from my excitement and from my scuba gear regulator. I wanted to get rid of that salt taste. And so there's my six shark bites. Well, I hope though, seriously, you've come to realize and appreciate that the theme music for Jaws is grossly inappropriate for these docile, beautiful, scavengers for the most part, hunters only when they have to be. And so that this beautiful um, music, classical music, might be much more appropriate than the theme from Jaws. I think you'd agree that maybe the most, most remarkable distinctive silhouette in the entire sea is that of a hammerhead shark. And scientists have for long pondered why this, uh, these lateral protrusions at the outmost portion of which they harbor their eyeballs in the flattened head of all hammerheads, this being a scalloped hammerhead shark in the video. Why, to what survival advantage is this flattened head, first of all? And the answer is their primary prey, you might remember, are stingrays. Well, the flattened head allows them to pin down stingrays in such a manner that the stingray can't um, sting it can't hit it with its barb. Also, the fact that they have an eye, as you see here on screen at the outermost point of each lateral protrusion, scientists have long suspected there must be some visual advantage for survival that these hammerheads have. And indeed, uh, McComb and colleagues about from Florida Atlantic University about 12 years ago, harvested different species of shark and brought them right into the lab and got them back into salt water as quick as they could. And they did literally visual field testing. And most sharks with pointy nose, their eyes are on opposite sides of their heads, they don't have binocular vision. Therefore, their depth perception isn't as good. Whereas looking at the two eyes you see on screen, they're this far apart. And because the eyes can move, the hammerheads have the unique capability of stereoscopic forward vision that overlaps the visual fields left and right by 32 degrees. Add to that the fact they can move their heads and their eyes back and forth, they have hugely capable stereoscopic vision, therefore depth perception. And because their eyes are on the sides of their heads, they can also do the same behind them and not get ambushed by their few predators. If you're wondering how did they do vision testing on hammerhead sharks, 
I'll show you this cartoon. It's just a joke. Again, what they really did was visual field testing. You know, I'll admit at one point in my life, a prior point, I was afraid of sharks. Now, I feel a different emotion. I feel afraid for the sharks. Because as was published back in 2016 in Nat Geo, sharks that once ruled the open seas as apex predators have all but vanished. But hey, I know you're waiting for it. So let me acknowledge the elephant in the room. Come on, Dr. Dave, sharks kill people. And that's true. So let's address it scientifically and accurately and factually. Each year across the globe, in the seven seas, sharks kill 15 people. Up just in the last five years, for reasons we don't know, clearly it's, I mean, we know that their intended prey, sea lions, seals like you see here on screen, are moving closer to shore into more coastal waters where there's more surfers and more recreational uh, ocean going people. So, I mean, that's why, but now why are the sea lions moving more coastally? Well, because their food source, the fish, are moving in. But the ultimate root cause analysis, whether it's global warming, you know, climate change, what have you, we just, we honestly don't know. That's the best answer. It is not known why that root cause is happening. But okay, the elephant in the room has now been addressed that sharks do kill 15 people a year worldwide. But just in the United States alone, dogs, sweet little, yeah, they kill 30 people annually in just the United States. Primarily postal workers, as, as you would expect. It's not a joke, but uh, that's how it goes. Um, worldwide, falling coconuts kill 150 people each and every year. You go, no, I was just in Maui uh, at the Marriott, at the Hyatt, at the Westin. I looked up in the palm trees, there's no coconuts. Darn right, there's no coconuts. They pay their land, landscaping, groundskeeping crew a lot of money to make sure that they don't have a statistic uh, happen on their property. Lightning kills 24,000 people every year. Mosquitoes bear, you know, mosquito-borne illnesses, malaria, yellow fever, dengue, Zika isn't lethal, uh, but nonetheless, all these uh, mosquito-borne illnesses kill 3 million people worldwide. Sharks, 15. Mosquitoes, 3 million. Okay, fellow Americans, texting while driving kills 2,600 Americans each and every year. And then this next one blows me away. It appeared in one of our medical journals from the Journal of Family Medicine and Primary Care. In six years, almost 260 people have died attempting to take a selfie. And I'm gonna wrap it up right here, right now, hopefully on time, by answering another question that has been elusive to many, though it's, the answer's been known to scientists and marine biologists for years, and that is, where does the ocean get its salt? And the, and the correct primary prevailing theory is that it gets its salt as groundwater runoff from the edges of continents. But then it, the salt just diffuses pretty much ubiquitously across the oceans. But it doesn't come out from the seafloor. It doesn't fall from the sky. It's primarily runoff of minerals and elements from groundwater. However, for the purpose of our discussion today, I'd like to propose an alternative theory as my final slide. Where does the ocean get its salt? It gets its salt from the tears of misunderstood sharks who just want to cuddle. And with that, I thank you for tuning in and for viewing today. And I certainly hope that you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed, albeit through Zoom, being with you. Thank you so very much. And thanks to the Kiwa Conservancy. Hi, everybody. I am Beth O'May. As Lee mentioned earlier, I was one of the, there were uh, six of us from Kiowa who traveled with Dr. Dave in the South Pacific a few years ago. And so I have benefited from seeing this presentation in the past. And we were on a cruise ship in the South Pacific 
uh, when we were had our days at sea, Dr. Dave was there every day telling us more about sea creatures and everything. And that's how we had, we, when I introduced myself and said that uh, we lived on an island with a turtle patrol, he said, oh, where? And I said, well, a little island off of Charleston, South Carolina. And he said, oh, where? And I said, Kiowa Island. He says, I know Kiowa very well. And he attends a medical conference in Kiowa on a regular basis. So that became the basis of our friendship with Dr. Dave. So that we, I had seen this presentation about the sharks and rays, and it, I really, really wanted to see it because when we were in Bora Bora, I had booked us, for six of us, a private tour, all day private tour around the island. Uh, the cruise ship did not have anything that appealed to me. I knew I wanted an all day deal and they did not have anything like that. So I just went on my own, found this highly rated tour and the six of us signed on. So even that day uh, of the tour, when we um, rode the, uh, ah, what's it called? When they take you in from, we were anchored out and we, we transported into the island. We rode in with Dr. Dave that morning and told him we, what we were doing. We were all in our green Turtle Patrol t-shirts. He was happy to see us and took our picture and everything and said we'd catch up with him later in the day. So we found our boat and Toki was our guide and he took us out of the, uh, harbor because there were a lot of people getting on boats and everything. So he took us out and I knew this day included uh, snorkeling, which I have done in many places. But I, this time there was mention over and over and over again of sharks and rays. So that's why I was particularly interested in hearing what Dr. Dave had to say. So I'm ready to go right? I've seen Dr. Dave. I know I'm not afraid of anything now. I can do this. So we went out and the first stop we made was uh, Toki, our guide, anchored the boat and jumped right off. He was waist deep in water. So it was, you know, a little bit higher than me for me because I'm shorter than he was. But anyhow, we got in the water and the rays and the sharks just came in. I mean, beautiful like he showed you, graceful and everything. And Toki, they know how to reach out and I hate to say grab, but get the rays and hold them there for you to feel their velvety skin and all of that. I know there's lots of you who have done this, but this was new to me. I was happy. I had done this. I'm standing in the water with the sharks and the rays. They didn't catch the sharks so much, but they caught the rays. So we got back in the boat and throughout this wonderful day, I mean, gorgeous optics, beautiful. We hear from a young man who's lived there all his life, the stories to tell. We stop on one of the Motus and have lunch. And we were at our last place for the day where we were snorkeling. And by then it was just me and one of the other people on the boat. So we, where we had stopped, Toki was able to jump off the front of the bow of the boat and he could stand. Where the ladder was on the back of the boat where I was, it was deep. So I was off the back of the boat, down into the water, had my snorkel ready to go. I start paddling and I bumped my snorkel, knocked it off. So I'm grabbing it in one hand. So I've got the snorkel in one hand. I'm doing a little dog paddle in the other hand. And Toki sees me and he says, come on over here, I'll help you put it back together. So I'm paddling along one handed, all of a sudden I'm moving forward. I'm not doing anything, I'm moving forward. This is a ray has come up behind me and he has seen me in distress. I wasn't really in distress, but I guess he figured I was in distress. This ray is pushing me forward and pushes me right over to where Toki was. I'm going, okay, I won't tell you what I'm going. But anyhow, there I was with, with Toki now. I'm going, what? what? And he, Toki fixed my snorkel and went on. Well, I get back on the boat later and come to find out, we already knew that Toki's father was also a guide and he had been taking Toki to this particular spot 
since he was three years old. Toki's now a handsome young man of 30 something with a wife and a child. He's still coming to this spot on a regular basis. Toki had already greeted this Ray when we got there. So the Ray knew that a friend of his was there. And then somehow he, you know, I went from nicely paddling, you know, snorkeling along to all of a sudden my one handed dog paddle. He knew something was wrong. And this Ray came along and pushed me over, took me right into Toki's hands where I was safe. I mean, is that an incredible story or what? That's it. That's my story, guys. There you go. And I have it all to thank Dr. Dave for that. That's beautiful. And, you know, it, it never ceases to amaze, you know, your listeners, any of us, the more time we spend in the water, the, the more amazing encounters we have. Your experiences sound incredible. When did you start becoming interested in marine wildlife? Gosh, um, I'll try to keep it to the two minute version rather than the 20. But basically as a child uh, growing up uh, not too far from Chesapeake Bay, and my dad always took me either fishing on lakes or over to the bay, uh, went out sailing with an Annapolis grad and his dad uh, on graduation day from the academy as a, as a probably five year old and just I got salt spray in my face and immediately identified a love for the ocean. I wasn't strictly pre-med in college. That love for the ocean perpetuated. I went to Pepperdine, which if you don't know is on the cliffs of Malibu overlooking the ocean. How the heaven was I supposed to study anyway? So pre-med wasn't gonna work out uh, for that reason alone, plus watching the migratory whales and the megapods of dolphins while sitting in the school cafeteria. Uh, that only amplified my ambition to get a master's or a PhD in marine biology. Uh, but candidly, there aren't many such programs in the United States. Uh, and the numbers of candidates they admit is, you know, single digits or maybe th up to 30, you know, whether it's Woods Hole or UC Santa Cruz or what have you. But there's lots of med schools. And the coursework I had done was for pre-med and marine biology undergrad degree. My degree is called natural science, the science of nature. Uh, it qualified as pre-med requisite, so I applied to 10 med schools and I think close to a dozen, a similar number of marine biology programs, and I got uh, rejected by every single marine biology program, and I got accepted by all 10 med schools. So I kind of had to believe that there was a message here uh, bigger than myself, and either that or it was a clerical error from UCLA, but that's history now. <laughs> So anyway, uh, with that, I uh, graduated with my MD from UCLA, never having lost sight, though I did have to shelf my passion for the ocean due to the rigors of, you know, med school and, and, and residency. But uh, first thing I, I know most people do after uh, residency, when they go out in private practice, they buy a nice car. I bought a small boat and, uh, and drive a lousy car. Still, it's still the same way. And that's all good. Um, I'd rather be in the water and uh, my license plate on the car can say, my other car is a yacht. So, uh, and it's not for luxury, it's for going out and being with the sea life and taking people out to share with us our, our love and, and the enjoyment. We never say we're going out whale watching or we're gonna go out and find the dolphins or the sea life. We never, we say, we're, we're going out on the boat. If you'd like to come, you're welcome to join. We never give an expectation. And that way, no matter what we see, it exceeds our expressed expectations and we're never disappointed. There's not a bad day out on the ocean. 